Hey everyone, welcome to Vision 2021, Inheritance of Hope's annual legacy event. We're so glad that you're here, hoping that you leave this weekend just feeling super encouraged with your tanks filled up, your souls feel a little bit more rested. My name is Jared Lopes. I am the founder of a ministry called Dad Tired, uh, which is a ministry that tries to equip men to lead their family well. So we do books and conferences and podcasts, which is why we have this whole fancy microphone set up. But I'm super excited to be hanging out with you guys this week. And I wish I could be there in person, but I'm glad to at least have this virtual meetup here. Um, I, a lot of people ask me like, Jared, how did you start dad tired? And why did you start dad tired? I had no plans, honestly, to start a ministry for dads or for young parents. Um, I kind of stumbled into it. I was a, I was a pastor for a long time. I'll spare you guys all the details of my, my own life story, but I was a pastor for a long time, tried to plant a church. I live here in Portland, Oregon, and uh, it went terrible. That's like the, the G version of the story. It just was really, really bad. And uh, I actually was in a season of depression and it was dark. I was in bed all the time. I didn't want to get out of bed. I had no motivation. My marriage was struggling. I was a terrible father. I was a terrible husband. I was a terrible friend, pulled away from the church, pulled away from Christian community. And if I'm totally honest, I actually thought, that uh, we were going to end up in a divorce, my wife, Layla and I, and um, I don't always like tell that side of the story, but that's a real part of the story. I was making plans in my head about how we would split up custody and who would go where and whose stuff would go where it was a really, really terrible season. And, um, and so I had no, like, I wasn't trying to start a ministry. In fact, I was trying to never be in ministry again. I was, I was really hurt by the church and thought I'm never going to do this again. Um, I'm already telling you more than I thought I would tell you. So I apologize. Welcome. I'm glad we're here and we're just diving into all of our mess. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, I was in a really dark season, really depressed and terrible spot in my marriage. Thought we were going to end in divorce. And my wife, um, she actually was waking up in the middle of the night and she was praying for me. And I didn't know this. And we were in the middle of a fight uh, one day, which was really common for us. We were arguing all the time. And we're in the middle of this fight and I could see that she's getting tears in her eyes. And in my selfish immaturity, I thought to myself as a young, dumb husband, oh, I'm winning. I'm winning the fight. And so I see tears in her eyes and I think, okay, I'm winning. And she says to me, she said, Jared, I, I've been setting my alarm to go off at two in the morning every morning. And I go into the living room and I've been praying that God would capture your heart again. And uh, I never, you know, what do you do in that kind of situation? You know, it's like, it's hard to like slam the door or stomp out or yell when your wife tells you that she's been getting up in the middle of the night to pray for you. But that was really the start of God drawing my heart back to his, of taking this wall that I had built up and starting to chisel away at it, break it down and bring my heart back to his. And, uh, and I, and I think God answered her prayer. Anyway, I'm telling you all this because I didn't plan on starting dad tired. I didn't plan on starting a ministry for dads and for husbands. I just personally was struggling as a man. And, uh, I, I was putting it out there, um, on line, which I guess is a good millennial thing to do. I'm like at the tail end or the high end of a millennial age group. And so I was just processing all my emotions online. I don't recommend that by the way, don't do that. But I, I did that. And, um, people resonated with it. There are a bunch of guys who are like, man, I feel the same way. I feel like I am not the kind of husband or father that I want to be that I know God's called me to be, but I don't want to give up. Every man in my family had given up, had bailed. And so that's all I knew. And, and I thought, I don't want this to keep being the pattern of my life and of my family's legacy. And so uh, I think God saved me again and he drew me back to his heart again. And, um, and, so guys started to resonate with that and more and more guys. And all of a sudden I found myself back in ministry, really passionate about coming alongside of guys and figuring out what does it look like to be the men God's called us to be, to be the parents God's called us to be. And that's how dad tired started. I always say God tricked me back into ministry, but the reason I tell you all that, and I'm sorry for kind of the, just pouring out my whole life story. I didn't mean for this to be a uh, rehash a counseling session, session here, but I tell you all that because sometimes we get into things. And they turn out to be way different than we thought they were going to be. Like I went into marriage thinking this is going to be awesome. I marry my best friend. We travel the world. We eat good food. We have babies. We have a house and buy a puppy and it's going to be wonderful. And then we'll die uh, or then we'll be old and we'll, you know, we'll hold our old hands together and our, we'll watch our kids. And it's just going to be a wonderful life together. And it turned out pretty quickly in a marriage. I was like, oh man, this is not 
at all what I thought it was going to be. This is way, way harder than I thought it was going to be. And it made me think about this verse uh, in Matthew 5. I'll read it to you here. It's in Matthew 5. It says this. Jesus is saying he has his disciples, his followers come alongside of him. And he says this. He opened his mouth. This is verse 2. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, be glad for your reward is great in heaven. And so they perse for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's kind of a weird verse, honestly. Like if you didn't have any context of the Bible or of Jesus and you read this, you'd be like, what in the world are you talking about? Like why, why, why are blessed? Why, why is Jesus talking about blessed are the poor in spirit? Why, are, why, why would you be blessed if you're mourning? You know, like that doesn't make any sense. And I think for the original audience, his original followers, they probably would have felt the same thing. They thought following Jesus was going to mean that they were in the kingdom. Jesus was going to build up this big kingdom. They'll probably have an army and a military to take over the world. They'll no longer be persecuted. They'll no longer be oppressed people. They're going to be free people with power to overtake the world with wealth and power and status. And yet Jesus' first words, this is actually the first sermon that Jesus ever gives to his disciples. And you would imagine they'd be on the edge of their seats like, oh man, what's this kingdom going to be like? The first time Jesus ever teaches a sermon to his disciples, his first words are, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. This is weird, man. If we're honest, this is like why they would have thought that, like, what in the world, Wait, Jesus, this, I think you got your script mixed up. Like, I think, can you like move on to the next lesson? What's the next one you got? Because this one's weird. This one's, what you, it's confusing. Because blessed for them look like status and power and wealth and health and prosperity. But Jesus is saying in his kingdom, blessed are the poor in spirit or blessed are those who mourn. The question that you'd have to ask yourself is why? Why would that be a blessing? It, that reminded me of this story right out of high school. Uh, I love being on the water. Uh, if I could live on a boat, I would. I wish my wife would let me just like one time I got to speak on a cruise and it was the best experience of my life. And I said, babe, can I just like, is there a way to be like a cruise speaker or like a, like a karaoke? Like I'll do anything. I'll do anything on a cruise. Anyway, uh, that's a side tangent. I love being on the water. So my friends right after high school asked me, they said, Jared, um, Hey, do you want to go float down the river? We would fill up these inner tubes and we would just float, spend a whole day floating down the river. So they said, Jared, you want to float down the river with us? And I was like, absolutely. Sounds amazing. Anything to do with the water. So I show up on a hot summer day and I've got swimsuit on, uh, I'm wearing no shirt, uh, and I've got my flip flops on and that's it. I got a tube flip flops and, and, uh, my, my swim trunks on. And so we're floating, we're being teenage boys talking about stuff and goofing off and being silly and, you know, just whatever. And it's a good time. We're having a great time. And towards the end of the day, we'd been floating all day and having a good time. One of my friends, Randy, he had actually taken an inflatable kayak. And so he said, Jared, do you want to take the inflatable kayak? And I'll swap you out. I'll, I'll be in the inner tube while you take the kayak. And I love the water and I'm a little bit of an introvert. So I thought, you know what? A little bit of time by myself could be fun. So I said, absolutely. So we did the awkward swap, trying not to fall in the river. And I got into his inflatable kayak and he got into the inner tube and I paddled up ahead. I said, Hey, I'm just going to go up ahead a little bit here. And I'll meet you guys later down the river. And they said, okay, that sounds great. So I'm paddling and the trees are kind of canopying over the river. It's beautiful. I, it was California. It's where I grew up, California summer day and the trees canopying over the water and the, the water's just kind of very gently floating me down. It's very relaxing, which is what I came for that day. I'm laying there 
and I'm just looking up at the trees and I hear this voice from behind me say, Hey man, have you ever done this river before? And I thought, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, how, what, what? So I turn around and, and I look over and, and I'm like, I'm sorry. And the guy say, Hey, have, have you ever done this river before? At this point, they had come alongside of me. These two guys are in whitewater kayaks with helmets, wetsuits, life jackets on. And I, in kind of my teenage, you know, arrogance was like, <laughs> okay, guys, like a little bit overkill here. You know, we're just floating down the river, calm down. But they pull up beside my inflatable kayak and they're like, have you ever done this river before? And they looked real serious. I'm like, no, I mean, uh, I've floated down a river before. Yes. You know? And so I'm kind of being arrogant and they say, okay, cool. Um, Hey man, just be careful because Satan's cesspool is up ahead. I said, I'm sorry. And they said, Satan's cesspool is up ahead. So just be careful. Um, I feel like at that moment, this is a hundred percent true story. I feel like at that moment, the current just immediately started to pick up. <laughs> And uh, they paddle off ahead of me and I see out in the distance. Now the water is like moving at a much quicker speed. I'm in my inflatable kayak, shorts, flip-flops, no shirt, no helmet, no life jacket. I, I'm like squinting my eyes, looking at them as they're going down the horizon. As we get closer and the water is now picking up, I can see people on shore. Specifically, there's a big rock right in the middle of the river. And there's a professional photographer taking pictures as kayakers, professional kayakers are dipping off of the waterfall into Satan's cesspool. <laughs> And I thought, oh my gosh, like, this is it. I'm in, we're moving too fast. I don't even know how to maneuver a kayak. Like I have no idea what I'm doing. So we're going fast. As I get closer, everyone's looking at me. The photographer looks even more scared than I do, which, I, which makes me scared. I'm like, what in the world is about to happen? Water's moving fast. We, I get to Satan's cesspool. I think, all right, Jared, you got this. Here you go, baby. Let's do this. Hit it. As soon as I hit the waterfall, my kayak folds in half. I go flying up into the air. I'm just like, you know, flying kayaks gone. I, I have lose the paddle, hit the water and the pressure of the waterfall is now pushing me under. I can feel myself getting hit with rocks and with sticks. I'm just like getting beat up. It was the first time in my life, maybe the only time in my life that I was actually praying for my life. Like, God, please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. Just getting beat up, getting beat up all over the place. And somehow like some miracle Jonah story. I just like kind of pop up out of water and I'm laying on the shore. Everyone's staring at me and I'm just looking around like what in the heck just <laughs> happened? Like what in the world is going on here? The only, my only regret from that day, or I guess I should say I had many regrets that day. My biggest regret from that day is not asking the photographer for all the pictures. Cause I could imagine how good of a Facebook profile or Instagram profile that would have been, but I'm just laying on shore. And I'm like, dude, I came to the river today to have a really relaxing float down the river. And now like I'm on shore, barely making it out alive. And everyone's staring at me. I didn't know my friends got out of the river long ago. They are already back at the car. And I just remember thinking like, I came here, like I'm in, I'm in board shorts and flip flops. I didn't plan on getting involved in Satan's cesspool today. My only plan was to have a relaxing float down the river. I tell you that story because I wonder if the disciples that day, when they're listening to Jesus's first words ever, his first sermon ever, if they showed up thinking, man, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be really cool to be part of Jesus's kingdom, to start following him because things are going to be great. And Jesus's first words are blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus was taking their idea of what it would look like to be in his kingdom, and he was flipping it up on its head. And he was saying, in my kingdom, this is what blessing looks like. I know in your kingdom, you have ideas of what it looks like to be blessed, money, status, fame, security, all that. But in my kingdom, here's what it looks like to be blessed. It would have flipped it up on their head. The truth is, fast forward thousands of years from that day, and blessing really looks the same in our culture. If you just search the hashtag blessed, um, you're probably not going to find people who are mourning, who are taking selfies of themselves crying, right? <laughs> um, that Most people don't consider that a blessing. Um, most people would say I'm blessed because I just bought this new house. Or I just got a good report at the doctor. I just got a raise, whatever it is. Look at this new car, hashtag blessed. 
But Jesus says, in my kingdom, you're blessed when you're mourning or poor in spirit. And again, we come back to the question, why? I think what Jesus was doing that day was he was taking their goal and he was reversing it. For them, the goal was health, wealth, prosperity. For Jesus, he was saying, the goal is me. I'm the goal. I am the greatest gift. A blessing when you're mourning. Why is it a blessing when you're mourning? Because you turn to Jesus in ways that you would have never imagined turning to him when you thought you had the world together, when you thought you could figure it out, when everything was going as planned, the way it should be. You weren't praying the way you would pray in desperation. When all of a sudden you find yourself in Satan's cesspool, you're praying to God in ways you would have never prayed to him before. I was in Africa one time and I heard the prayers of a dad uh, who had kids. They were getting water out of this river. And by the time we got there, dozens of kids had died trying to get water from a river because they were getting eaten by crocodiles. And I listened to this dad pray over his family and over his kids. And he was praying with a kind of desperation that I had never heard before. And I thought to myself in that moment, this guy knows God in ways that I may never know him. And I think Jesus would say he's actually the blessed one. And so maybe you signed up for this whole following Jesus thing, thinking it would be one thing. You went into this life thinking you'll go to church and you'll do all the things that you're supposed to do as a good person. And yet you find yourself in some rapids, some really hard, unexpected things. And the world around us might say, man, I'm so sorry. But I wonder if Jesus would say, you're blessed. You are blessed because you are going to get to know me in ways that you would never get to know me otherwise. You're going to know me in ways that a lot of people will never get to know me. Um, You may be experiencing some things. Those of you who are here today may be experiencing some things that the world might say is tragic really, really hard things. And I don't want to make, put down how serious these things are. But I guess I just wonder if the blessing isn't to avoid the rapids, but maybe the blessing is to actually to get to know Jesus in ways that you would have never known him in the middle of the rapids. Maybe you're the blessed one. Maybe the way you'll know God and your relationship with him and the things that your family, the ways that it will cling to each other and cling to God is a blessing. Maybe you're in the middle of your blessing and you didn't even know it. You know, whenever I'm speaking or I'm traveling, people will often come up to me afterwards and say, God bless you, brother. God bless you. And I just say, hold on, hold on. (laughs) Don't put that on me (laughs) because in the kingdom, God's blessings look a lot different than what the world's blessings look like. But ultimately I do know that God's blessings are best. They don't look like what the world's blessings look like, but to know Jesus in ways that others might not might mean that I have to mourn or be poor in spirit or a little bit broken. And at that point, I realize everything else that I thought would give me security can't. Not a bank account, not a job, not a doctor's report. Nothing in this world will give my soul the peace it longs for outside of Jesus. Maybe that's the blessing. Maybe the blessing is knowing, oh man, I've been deceived. I've been looking for satisfaction and for peace everywhere else. And maybe now in the midst of my brokenness, I get to know what real peace looks like. His name is Jesus. I hope you guys have a great weekend. I hope your souls are filled up that deep, what the Jewish people would call shalom, not just happiness, not just this kind of weekend high but this deep peace deep inside of your soul where you feel like, no, my, my, my soul is actually at rest because of Jesus. And so with hesitancy, um, but in all sincerity, I pray that you're blessed. I pray that you know Jesus in ways that you may have never known him before. I love you. Thanks for listening.